for our second panel of the day. Uh, we have three folks in the room, one folk online, and uh, they are going to be talking about the promises and pitfalls of human AI coordination, language translation as an emerging case. They will be taking questions at some point, maybe in the middle, maybe just at the end, depending on how timing is going. I think Joel is serving as moderator, so why don't you all take it away? All right. Welcome, everybody. We have a really cool panel. Uh, I'm very honored to pinch hit as the moderator. Uh, I'm going to start off with a brief uh, names of the uh, panelists, and then we'll set some context with uh, introductions. So two people in person. We have on the left here, uh, Maureen Karpot. She's an associate professor of computer science. Um, I will not read out her whole bio, which is uh, too long to suffice to say, super qualified, excellent work in the general area of language technologies and machine translation, multilingual NLP. Um, you can read her full bio in the program. Uh, next to her is uh, Ge Gao. She's an assistant professor in the I school joint with UMIX as well. And um, she's coming at it from a, a human centered perspective, I guess, uh, with a PhD in COM and uh, works in the general area of HCI. And then uh, over on the giant screen here, uh, we have Michel Simar. Um, he's coming to us from Canada, uh, where he's a senior research officer at the National Research Council of Canada and uh, kind of working in the general area of machine translation. So rather than introducing them um, with a bio, we can actually set some context with specific to the panel with the first kind of uh, introductory question of sharing what's your experience with machine translation. Um, so why don't we start with, with Ge, and we'll kind of go around. You can interpret that question however you like. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess I can tell some short story about how I get into machine translation or language model relevant research in general. I think the all date back to even before I entered a PhD, my first ever research experience in ATCI is done in Microsoft Research Asia. There I worked with a very, very global team, including people from eight different countries. So figuring out the common ground using firstly English as a common language, then you can notice from time to time, people will do code switching, which are blending across different modality and conversation language choices to set up daily work, really become a very predominant thing. And because in that context, we're getting the work done, this is a very high stakes situation. So that is first ever in my life, I get to recognize, okay, cross-lingual communication have a huge value, but so far we do not have perfect technology to support that. So then for my PhD at Cornell at Communication, me and my advisor, we started wondering, then there's a way we can just make commission translation work better for us uh, in the case of not just global teamwork, but also, for example, international people get adapt to a local scenario, these type of cases. But I guess there, because I haven't met with people like Michelle and Marin here, we were more thinking about, okay, if we know machine translation is not perfect, how can we run human research to help people make the best use of imperfect translation outcome? Which I guess is very different, but complementary in a nice way, a different question to what those machine translation real builders are, are doing in their work. So I guess this is how I start the current very exciting journey working with Marine first and through the introduction met with uh, Michelle later. So I guess then I will pass that to your version of the story. I think it's from a very different perspective from mine. Yes, so um, I come to machine translation from an engineering perspective. Um, I've been building machine translation systems for a little over 20 years. Uh, and when I first started um, as a graduate student, also in Asia, in, in Hong Kong, uh, I vividly remember the first translation system I built uh, that translated from Chinese into English. And, you know, I was very proud the first time I trained it and got it to output something. The outputs were terrible. It was like word salad. You know, you looked at a bunch of words and then try to say, okay, maybe this is what it means. I don't know, you know, a little bit like reading tea leaves. Uh, and fast forward 20 years, we have systems that are really good, right? Not only um, uh, translation systems, but systems that generate text that 
many of you probably use um, in your everyday life. And so that's been really exciting. Uh, but this, with this progress and you know, hearing more and more from people who are actually using it, and now it's not just a technology in the lab, but, but it's out there, uh, I've gotten increasingly worried about how people think it works all the time when sometimes it doesn't um, and use it in really high stakes scenarios like in hospitals uh, or in immigration cases. And that makes me really worried. So um, that's what got me to connect with people like Go and start to think about, OK, now that we have this powerful technology, what should we do so that people can actually use it in a way that is reliable and safe and, um, and make it actually useful? Uh, so that's my, my story with machine translation. Uh, Michelle, what about you? Um. Yeah, I, I was really lucky to start working around machine translation as soon as I got out of university. Uh, and it was really by, by just sheer luck. I happened to be at the right place at the right time and then got a summer job in, in a Canadian government research center where they, I didn't know it, but there, there was some, some uh, they, they were doing state-of-the-art machine translation for, for the time. And when I say uh, the time, uh, I'm, I suspect it was a time possibly before the other two panelists were born, um, but, or, or, or close to that period. <laughs> um, so as I said, that first job was at the Canadian government um, and where most of the empty work that is done is done in support of official languages. Uh, as you may or may not know, Canada has an official languages policy. There are two official languages in Canada, French and English, uh, which means lots and lots and lots of translation. Um, so very early on, I was exposed to the technology and what it could and could not do. And believe me, at that time, there was not much that it could do. Um, but also, I had the opportunity to work with um, professional linguists and professional translators, because uh, that was a time also when to do research in machine translation, uh, you needed uh, these people nowadays you it's like you can do without the linguists uh, there was a famous joke in the uh, in the 1990s where uh, there was a the, the head of a very famous research lab who said every time i fire a linguist my ratings go up uh, my performance go up, goes up um and but yeah at that time uh we had linguists and we were working also alongside professional translators because they were the, the main target of of uh, the technologies that we were developing and they these people taught me a lot about uh language and about how we humans uh, uh do this this weird thing uh, that we call translation and almost unbelievably i find myself yeah, what more than 35 years later, um, again working for Canadian government, uh, again working in support of, of official languages in Canada uh, and with professional translators. And um, in, in particular, this, this, uh, this time, this year uh, for uh, me and my team uh, is really important because uh, we're right in the process of rolling out uh, machine translation systems for the translators of the Canadian Parliament, who uh, you could say are the F1 drivers of professional translators in Canada. Um, so, um, so this is really exciting right now. So yeah, that's my story. Very cool. Very different uh, backgrounds and stories. Some snippets of uh, some pre-prepared question themes already coming up. Um, I thought we could start with, since the theme, the title is Promises and Pitfalls, I thought we could start uh, making things a bit uh, concrete in the beginning in terms of there's probably a, a bit of a sense in the air that like things have changed in NLP over the past, you know, however many months, I guess, uh, depending on time scale. Uh, but in the sense of like, what's the state of the art in terms of promises and pitfalls? Where um, are machine translation technologies working really well? and where are they not really working well at all? And what does that tell us about um, 
what we can rely on and what is left to work on. So I'll let you sort of, you know, um, chew on that question. Uh, anybody can start and uh, I will try to uh, poke a little bit if I need to. But that's kind of a general prompt, like what's working well, what's not working well. Okay, I can get started. So, um, so right, so machine translation systems are um, machine learning systems um, powered by deep learning. And just like any machine learning system, they do really well when they are asked to do things that are close to the data that they've been trained on. So what that means is that we have really good systems uh, that can translate for um, languages for which we have a lot of examples of translations. So that's the case for French and English, for um, many of um european languages uh that's not the case uh for um many languages for instance in africa or um, languages in asia that do not have as many resources even within the high resource languages there's also a high variability depending on the kind of language you're translating and how close is it to the dominant language that you might find in um news or um, texts that is dominant on the web Right, so what that means is that if you're if you're translating something that is looks like a formal official document or a news article or even kind of a um, social media post, um, you know, by the dominant user population, then you'll probably have a reasonable translation quality. But if you're translating uh, language from a dialect that is underrepresented uh, or talking about a topic that is underrepresented the transition quality is probably going to be worse. Um, you can try it out, right? Tools like um, uh, Google Translate, Bing Translator, and others are pretty representative of the state of the art. Uh, and they are overall pretty good. Um, but I think the challenge is that even in the languages where they're really good, they can still fail, um, and sometimes in ways that are a little unexpected. Yeah, maybe what, but if you allow me, uh, I think that the uh, the most multilingual system that we have right now, uh, at least that I know of, uh, and that would be uh, the uh, the system that is known by the name of No Language Left Behind, covers about two hundred languages. That's out of the seven thousand languages that are spoken uh, on this planet currently so that gives you an idea of where we are uh, relative to that and maybe to add also to what marine was saying um when we talk about uh, uh the kinds of languages that are covered uh, that are well covered by uh, existing online machine translation systems um at least uh, until recently uh, the kind of data that we needed to train these systems were what we needed was parallel data. That is data for which we have a good translation, a, 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 a good quality source text and a good quality translation. Um, this uh, is fairly common for um, official texts, uh, government kind of material uh, and stuff like that. But as soon as you dive into social media, um, that kind of less formal text, we don't have good quality translations for those texts. And so we are training from what we can find. This is changing because the systems now can rely less on uh, this kind of uh, 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 parallel uh, training data, but still it is a problem. Very interesting. So I guess my takeaway on that question, I think is partially a consequence because of the so impressive work people like Miranda Michel have been doing. So it entirely changing our initial perspective of, okay, so here are a lot of imperfect translation. Let's try to pick out those good part out of that towards here are so good of a translation as how it looks like, then what are we going to do? So I guess here I can provide two more concrete example. One of them is about in a conversational scenario. When people speak in a different native language, we run a lot of uh, research in the case of, for example, social interaction, workplace, water cooler conversation to see how much in translation will alter the dynamics. And there we started to see is, because so far the translation is getting 
better and better in terms of being natural sounding and looks very fluent. It will trigger a phenomenon that in communication we call delayed repair. So if we are all have the common uh, transparency about how the language use, then once you say something I don't understand, I will notify you, you recognize. But then the things that the output so far looks so well, repair process get delayed, usually at the moment when we really see a big problem happen. Like we talk for 10 minutes and I recognize, oh, I totally misunderstood what they're saying. But there could have been recognized earlier. But so far, I'm not able to recognize that because everything looks very good at the surface level. So without a lot of empty literacy or without a very good way to reflect on the result, you don't know. This is one example. I think another example is because translation itself is difficult in terms of there are no very strict one-on-one -on -one corresponding way to translate a particular thing. Um, it will trigger a problem in terms of how to convey and recover nuances, right? So one of the research projects I've done with my uh, colleagues here at UMD is we look at, for example, how immigrants and migrants do news consumption about COVID relevant information over the past COVID years. So one thing we noticed quite interesting is for a lot of non-English native speaking um, immigrants living here, reading English news about COVID every day, when we use in situ tracking to look at their uh, health uh, indicator, trigger a really high level of anxiety. Comparing to they look at a similar type of content and use, but in their ethnicity media that's written in their native language. So when you go to talk to them, you try to figure out why. It's exactly because people mention, because I'm not fully fluent in this language, so I cannot recover what exactly are the, for example, effective meaning they try to convey. So the more I read those English news, the more I feel there's no hope, like things are never getting better. Like everything you talk about are so bad. But when those news are written in my native language, I'm able to unpack more details and see, oh, so here they try to use a more positive tone to indicate a promising future. Here they try to say, oh, those things go badly, but see the hedging they're using here indicating it's not that much bad, <laughs> right? So logic like that, I think those are all very interesting questions we think about with this already very good mission translation, if we, if we want to make it even better <laughs> than the current one. I think these are two things that really challenge our, like my understanding, at least back to 10 years ago, when I think about what is error in metric translation. I don't think so far the wording is really error or wrong translation, but something else. Because there are different ways to format it or carry in different subtlety, if that makes sense to the rest of you. Yeah. I have follow up questions, <laughs> but y'all can, you're welcome to respond. But. This is really fascinating. So, Maureen, you said something earlier about how some of these, these systems will fail in unexpected ways. At the same time, you gave us a wonderful set of expectations about where we expect these systems to work better or worse, right? High resource languages, common topics, Michelle, um, you know, parallel data, formal languages, that kind of thing. And the thing I'm wondering, I can sort of channel the HCI question. How much of this is known or communicated to users in terms of like a sense of the capabilities and limitations of the models? So that's like part one. And then from Ger's side, like articulating almost like if you imagine the traditional way of analyzing performance, you have like, you know, error analysis or confusion matrices or whatever. And what you're saying is that it's not quite correct or wrong, but it's like better understanding of a more nuanced understanding of its capabilities. And so I'm very curious about how we put those together in terms of, you know, does, what's the intersection between what Ge is seeing in terms of the, it's working well here, it's not working so well here in terms of nuance with high resource, formal languages, like the characteristics where it's doing well right now. And then I guess the follow-up question would be how to be sort of make this knowledge available to users? Do we want to make this knowledge available to users? That kind of thing. Okay, so let me get started on that. Um, so first, in terms of like, you know, what, what systems, the way as kind of more engineers, we've been thinking about these issues like machine translation quality and, and helping users. 
um, you know, I think it's been somewhat limited. Like we're not there quite, you know, able to provide all the things that Go would like to have uh, in, in the use cases that she was sketching. Um, I think, um, and Michelle can talk more about this, like a lot of the work that's been done in terms of trying to think how people use machine translation in the core engineering research has focused on um, helping human translators be more productive. And that's very helpful. Like that's a real like use case. Um, and and translators use machine translation tools routinely today. Um, but there, that's not representative. I mean, that's that's not representative of the broad range of uh, use cases where people who are not professional or who might not even understand the the language that they're translating into are actually using the tools, right? Um, and so, you know, translators like they look at the output, they are able to tell if it's wrong, and they will go and fix it, right? They they'll figure out what to do. Uh, but lay users are not always able to do that. Um, and we do not really have good ways of supporting them right now. That's something that I think um, Go and I and, and uh, many other researchers are interested in in figuring out how to do. Uh, we do have tools that automatically um, estimate the quality of a system, uh, but it's not yet clear how do you present that feedback in a way that actually helps people do something about it. Um, so, you know, like some things we're thinking about is like, how can we help people uh, maybe rephrase their input so that um, it, it produces a better translation with um, a given system? Um, how do we help them assess whether um, like using a translation in a particular context is risky or not? Because sometimes, you know, the translation is not great, but that's okay, right? It's not a big deal. Uh, but sometimes it's a lot more risky. Uh, and then sometimes the risk has to do with the core content. Sometimes it has to do with the tone and think the, the, the nuances that Go was mentioning. Um, and we don't have ways of doing that well right now. Um, but, you know, as a researcher, I find that interesting because I think that's like a very, very promising direction for, uh, for future work. Yes, uh, and maybe to add to what you're saying, we we don't have good ways of knowing that. And and the way that current applications, especially if you think about online machine translation, the way they are designed, um, there there's no way actually for the system to know who is using it and for what purpose. I mean, there is some limited access, but it's extremely limited. And and how you should interact with the user depends a lot on who the user is and 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 what their purpose what their goal is are they professional translators are they bilinguals do they know both languages that they're working with uh, and and you even have a, 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 possibly a very common situation where uh, you have a user who's native his, his first language their first language is not covered by the machine translation so they'll be using a second language to access information in a third language which they do not know at all so this is this makes for very different scenarios very different situations and without a minimal knowledge of who you are dealing with it's extremely difficult to provide a service, to provide uh, uh, results that are uh, easily interpretable by uh, by the users. So, um, and and also there's a, the historic fact that uh, machine translation from the start has been uh, has been conceived as a very simple uh, 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 application. I mean, conceptually, you have a box and you have language that comes in one end and language that comes out the other end. Um, and once you have to explain what you're doing, what, once you have to uh, interact uh, significantly with the user, uh, that model breaks down and it's very difficult to come up with a model that actually uh, uh, does it better. So it's a real challenge. All right, uh, someone flashed a five minute warning. Uh, so I'd like to pause for any audience questions.
Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom. I, my question is, uh, uh, how are you dealing with like Spanglish and emojis and urban dictionaries and all these other very different, interesting things that are appearing on the internet that are neither English nor Spanish nor French nor nothing. So it's just expressions that people do understand, though, at least on the pragmatics level, they are very clearly understood by a lot of people. So how are you managing this? more complex level of communication that's appearing nowadays? Um, so current systems um, are trained on more than one language at a time, like systems like Google Translate, Microsoft Translator, and so on. So they will not crash on Spanglish, but that doesn't mean that the output they produce is necessarily good. Um, so like systems are multilingual so they can like you know then they know about words in more than one language so if you have mixed spanish and english they'll, they'll produce an output however like there's a lot of you, like, pragmatics and additional like, information that is encoded by the choice of language right when you're switching relating to tone and intent and all sorts of things and all sorts of context um and that is just not handled at all uh by current systems um, when it comes to things like emojis and so on, you know, as long as they are present to some degree in the training data, systems will be able to do something reasonable with them. Uh, but there's no dedicated handling uh, of these. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think it, it could be something that would be interesting to add layers, you know, instead, as Michelle was saying, we've treated the problem of machine translation as text in, text out. That's a simple function as computer scientists. We know how to work with that. Um, but I think a lot of the limitations that we're hitting now are come from the fact that for being useful in the real world, this like text in, text out is just not sufficient. We want an output that is multidimensional, that maybe it's text, but it's also augmented by additional information. Um, and figuring out how to do that is a big open question for research. So I guess I can add something to the discussion is, firstly, I. I do not really have an answer directly for this question, but again, there is something interesting to think about in terms of the research paradigm shifting in this space roughly. So I guess it all falls into the common rule of let's try to leverage the human wisdom a little bit more while working with MD so that it can coordinate together. So I think that in the classical way of looking at machine translation, media, the communication or information seeking in general means approach, for example, crowdsourcing. For any question that machine itself cannot diagnose in the proper way, we have crowd worker way in their input, and we all know the risk here is it doesn't guarantee all the time you have high quality crowd worker and their input can always get in, integrated get in the proper way for them. But I think these days the discussion has been shifting to so if we think human and machine in this case machine translation are both good and bad at something, but those good and bad are different. <laughs> then we can team up to do something interesting together. And then when we, in my research context, when I talk with migrant immigrants living in the United States, for example, in terms of how they navigate everyday English or whatever, I think their preference is they want in the future to have a conversational machine translation pop up in terms of the system will fall behind our stuff and they sort of know they're getting stuck somewhere. So they will acquire some clue from this person so this person, yeah, because they're using machine translation, they are not a fluent, for example, English speaker, but they have capability of recognizing the context, which might be useful for the translation to polish the outcome, where they know what is the social convention they want to follow, so they can provide that information in the even harder coded way, some category, right? Tell that to the translation. Um, I think then I will count out technical experts to make it really happen. But that sounds to me is a very reasonable angle to push forward some future work. And that has been something I've been thinking a lot about recently, the, the way how we can team up this layperson user who have limited target language fluency, but the also machine translation, so they are good and bad at different things, but they complement each other. We have an extension of our time. We have additional four minutes. I think there was a question over there. Is it Hira? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I would like to hear about how you would approach in terms of the language transition from foreign language, sign language to American sign language, uh, because 
facial expression is also part of their language. So, so far, text language to, um, I'm sorry, yeah, so I, I, I would like to hear about how you would approach for that. Yeah, so all the state of the art methods I was talking about do not work quite well yet for sign language. Uh, and that's mostly a question of data. Um, you know, you can scrape the web and find a lot of translate, you know, English text has been translated into French or vice versa. But if you scrape the web, you just don't find uh, a lot of videos of uh, um, American sign language uh, translated into other sign languages or um, uh, or in spoke translated into spoken language, right? So, um, so there is work um, that, as you point out, has to be multimodal uh, because you need to encode. It's it's very challenging. You need to encode not just the video, but like um, like the gestures and facial expression that encode syntax and so on. And so that's like a complete departure from the way we're treating translation, especially for texts where you just have a sequence of tokens as input and produces a sequence of tokens as output. Um, it's much more challenging. There is definitely work in that space, um, but as far as I know, no good systems yet. Uh, I think a big issue has been that many of the research efforts have not been well connected with the communities that actually need these tools. Um, and, um, you know, I think that there are there's work, uh, including by people at Maryland that that try to address that. But we are we're still in the early stages. Anything from Michelle to add? Well, I, I unfortunately, uh, there's a sign language translation expert uh, that normally sits right behind me. And unfortunately, unfortunately, she's not in the office today. <laughs> but but one of the things that I know is that um, uh, there is there is uh, one of the problems uh, is that there is a, a, a lot of uh, a resistance uh, in the sign uh, language speaking community uh, towards, for example, the use of avatars. Um, in in uh, displaying uh, computer generated sign language, and this is okay. What do we? How do we overcome this uh, this uh, this challenge there? So that's one of the realities there. Very interesting. And I guess for I don't have anything to add to this conversation, but I want to shout out to our own Hernes. So I think she's actually the expert if we talk about sign language, uh, any like algorithmic tool for that. It's Hernes that have a lot of knowledge and, and research in that space. So probably that's a future direction we can all explore together. Yeah. Absolutely, including the connection to the community. Victoria, I think you are probably the last question. Okay, um, so my question was, uh, I, I do a lot of crowdsourcing with historical text materials, and I wonder to what extent, um, you know, older versions of English or French or whatever language um, can enrich or complicate these models, um, and uh, whether um, corpora like in Google Books, for example, which may have a lot of those sort of more traditional scholarly editions of like, okay, this is the 12th century English version, and then this is the, um, you know, now modern version in the early um, 1900s. Like, how does that work? Does it work? Um, so, you know, if, if I, I think out of the box, uh, systems are going to translate into the dominant version of the data that they've been trained on, which is going to be the modern version. Um, it is possible to adapt systems to older, to anything you have data for, right? And um, the same technology that powers um, translation models has been used to say, you know, quote unquote, translate Shakespeare English to modern American English. Um, and so this could be done for um, any languages that we have data for. Um, but that would require custom, uh, kind of custom adaptation, like the, um, by the default tools that you have that are available online would not do a good job at handling historical language. As you probably already know. And the, and the challenge is always the quantity of data that you have available. I mean, um, 
uh, as you as you go uh, closer in time to to the the, the current time, uh, you you have exponentially more data available, and the systems that we that that you can find online for machine translation right now uh, are, are have been uh, fed with uh, humongous quantities of very recent. Uh, uh, English and other languages, but as you go back in time, there's less and less of the of that um, type of data available, and that's that's an additional challenge. Uh, you can try to fine tune an existing system using that data, but if you have very little of it, it's difficult. So, we still need human experts. Unfortunately, we are out of time, which is very sad because it feels like we've got a lot of momentum. Please catch the panelists. Uh, reach out to them and continue these conversations. Thank you so much for this conversation.